I've never been too much of a Minecraft fan. I've played it on and off with friends a few times, but not much beyond that. Something about it never really held my attention. Obviously, that can be said for lots and lots of other people, so I've been interested in diving deeper into Minecraft for quite some time. With this video, I figured it was finally the right time to do so. In it, I'm going to show you my perspective on some of the game's standout features and qualities and how these have evolved, if they have at all. This will all be done from the perspective of a PC player, so just a heads up on that. Anyway, with that all said, let's dive right in. First, I think it's important to acknowledge the core concept Minecraft started out with. The way I see it, it can basically be boiled down to making a world your own, and honestly, that's a damn good idea. It leaves a lot up to the player as they are let loose into this world, and they can do as much or as little as they want. It's their world, their rules, their way to play. The concept is simple, but there is a lot of depth here. The execution of this whole concept is what makes it truly shine, though. The block-based system Minecraft functions on is so easy to understand, I think anyone can grasp it without much effort. This makes it simple to mold the world to your liking, and you can also immediately see the effects of your labor. Once you start out, you'll begin to build a base of operations and extract resources around you. The game incentivizes you to create your own little, or big, part of this world, making your surroundings feel like home quickly and developing a sense of pride in players. They look at the work they put in and go, Wow, I really made that! That's awesome! If you can invoke that sort of feeling in your players through very basic mechanics alone, which Minecraft does, even without crafting, which we'll get to in a bit, I think you have a very strong concept on your hands. Now, to go into something somewhat related, when Minecraft first released to the public, the worlds were pretty tiny, all things considered. They really felt like sandboxes more than anything. You'd reach the edges of the world pretty quickly, and so they offered limited space for building and exploring. They were randomly generated though, much like the Minecraft we know today, so every world you created was different in some fashion. While these worlds were charming in a way, kind of feeling like their own little pocket dimensions, when you reached the boundaries of the world, it was immersion-breaking and pretty disappointing, honestly. These worlds were overwhelmingly finite. And in a game that's focused on making worlds your own, being blocked out by arbitrary limitations like that can be underwhelming. But all of that changed when InfDev, the fourth development phase of Minecraft, rolled around in 2010. This new phase of Minecraft featured the game's biggest change in world generation ever. Derived from its full name, Minecraft Infinite Development, the game now featured worlds that were essentially infinite. They were and still are enormous. So much so that I've never even seen the edge of a Minecraft world, and believe me, I've tried to find it. Not only was the surface area of the worlds made bigger, so was the height. As a result, Minecraft could play around with generative mountains for the first time. But all that aside, this is it. This is the full realization of Minecraft's core concept. There is a world now, one with seemingly no end, tons of things to discover and keep players busy, but most importantly, nearly infinite room to play with. The world itself became a vehicle to propel the player into creativity as well, even more so when different areas in the world called biomes were added. You see a desert climate and go, wow, I could make an oasis-like area over there. You look at a mountain and go, wow, I can make a cool mountaintop city that goes as high as the clouds on here. These were only examples I thought of in a few seconds. Imagine what people could do with weeks, months, or years to cook up these elaborate ideas. All in all, the change in world generation was all about freedom and expanding creative scope for everyone, and it succeeds in that with flying colors. Now to move on to another huge addition to the game, crafting was introduced in the in-depth phase of Minecraft's development in 2009 and made a huge impact on the game's direction, but also the game's success. Assuming you're playing a regular game of Minecraft Survival, crafting is at the core of everything you do and every mechanic you interact with. When you're extracting resources from the land, what are you using them for? Crafting of new blocks, materials, or tools. When you're defeating enemies, what are you using their drops for? Crafting of new blocks, materials, or tools. When you want to expand your home base or make other creative structures, what do you do? Craft the necessary blocks and materials. Crafting is always a means to an end. It's a system that facilitates interaction with most of the game's features and mechanics, as it can really only be fully utilized when you're interacting with everything the game has to offer. If you don't, you might lose out on cool blocks you could use, or maybe useful tools for extracting resources easier. 
The crafting system is at the core of this game, and for good reason. Everything I just mentioned makes it such a strong addition to the game, I definitely don't think Minecraft would have found as much success as it did without it. On a related note, the crafting table, the block the whole crafting system revolves around, is brilliant too. When you're first starting out in Minecraft, the crafting table is one of the first blocks you'll build. It's important, but kind of a hassle to keep dragging around, so you're probably going to want to build your base of operations around it. To protect it, but also yourself, when nighttime hits and enemy mobs start to come out to kill you. Of course, this base of operations can be whatever the player wants it to be. As a result, even the least creatively inclined players will be forced to interact with the building aspects of the game and leave even more of a mark on their world, once again filling the player with that sense of accomplishment and pride after the fact. All this stemming from the inclusion of this one very important block. That all being said, the crafting system was not always without issues. The biggest one that had plagued the game for a long time was the lack of a crafting recipe book. Crafting was implemented into the game in the in-dev development phase back in 2009, but until the 1.12 update in 2017, there was no way to view any of the frankly essential crafting recipes in the game itself. When the crafting table offers you a 9x9 crafting grid, and when there are dozens upon dozens of different materials to use, when you're just starting out, you basically have to have some stroke of pure luck to figure out most of the crafting recipes. That, or have a friend tell you about them, or look them up online. I don't think any of these are good for a system so ingrained into the game. Luckily, this problem was completely alleviated in the 1.12 update with the recipe book, where all the crafting recipes gradually unlock based on what kind of materials you acquire and what actions you undertake within the game. This was an incredibly graceful way to introduce these recipes, as it still keeps some surprises for the player as to what they'll be able to do with the materials they collect and craft. Moving on from that, an often overlooked part of Minecraft is the farming. This was also introduced in the in-depth phase of development in 2009 with crafting and tools. Which makes sense, because farming is very dependent on the whole tool to get anything done. While you might think I like farming because of some mechanical or game design strength, as that has been my argument for most of the other things I've mentioned thus far, that isn't entirely the case here. Don't get me wrong, farming is still a very valuable asset to the game in creating variety in gameplay, but I like it for slightly more abstract reasons. See, farming, in my opinion, raised creative scope far above what was attainable before the time of its release. It also provided, and continues to provide, a bigger sense of immersion into this game world. As a result, I feel like farming can really provide a more cohesive fantasy for players when they're inhabiting their Minecraft worlds. When you have a farm next to your self-made village, you can start to imagine what kind of backstory your town would have, who would live there. This is just one of many examples where farms can be beneficial for player expression and immersion, but of course, as with anything in Minecraft, the possibilities are endless. That isn't to say that farming is perfect, though. As with most things in Minecraft, the way in which the game goes about explaining this mechanic to you is quite, a uh, hands-off. You can craft the whole tool pretty easily, but then you kind of have to just figure it out. While it makes sense, the game never states that you need water next to your blocks to be able to grow any crops. Just like crafting back in the day, this is a case of needing the mechanic to be explained to you by outside sources, and you know how I feel about that. I do think this choice comes from a good place, though. This is speculation, but I feel like the game wants to preserve its freedom, and to not lock the player down into tutorials or anything like that. That would be commendable, but if that were the case, why not implement optional tutorials or tutorial worlds players can explore different, less obvious mechanics in? Old console versions of Minecraft also include a tutorial, so why not on PC? Anyway, let's switch gears to something completely different. Redstone. I'm going to keep this section brief, but honestly this mechanic is too crazy and too impressive to not mention in at least some capacity. Redstone, for the uninitiated, is Minecraft's version of electricity, first introduced in Minecraft Alpha in 2010, but added upon in later versions. From what I understand, it's boolean-based, essentially binary. This makes the system quite technical and also hard to understand, though I can forgive that in this case since it's very straightforward in how technical it is. It's clearly intended for those who want to spend hours figuring this sort of stuff out. I do wish, once again, that there was some sort of tutorial explaining how this system works. But that is not the point of Redstone. The point is the incredible feats of, well, 
basically engineering that players can accomplish with this. Redstone is such a fascinating system because it has so many different uses. People have used it to enhance their gameplay by making automatic mining machines, but they have also used it for creative projects. I think my favorite use of the system by far has been an actual working computer completely made using Redstone. It's a system with loads and loads of potential and versatility. From a game design perspective, I think it's a great inclusion as it's something complex for technical players to really sink their teeth into in an otherwise simple game while still fitting right in with Minecraft's creative aspects. It even often enhances them. This way, the game's main appeal doesn't crumble but is added onto, attracting more kinds of players. Now, this next one isn't really about creativity at all. The Nether, also introduced in 2010's Minecraft Alpha, was added as a new sort of endgame area. You can only access it by making a portal out of the material obsidian and lighting it on fire with a flint and steel. In this place were a few new enemy types and materials to find, but other than that, I don't think the Nether really adds that much to the game. Or that's what I would have said if the latest update, 1.16, or the Nether update, which released last year, hadn't come out. Honestly, since its first inclusion, the Nether have been pretty much neglected. Aside from a few materials you could build with, and enemies to gather resources from, and generally a fiery change of scenery, the Nether didn't really add many integral features or anything. The Nether was quite samey, so exploring it wasn't all that exciting either. But with the Nether update, all of that changed. There were new biomes, making for a variety in environments, enemy mobs, as well as blocks and materials, but one of these materials was an actual good reason to explore the nether. Ancient Debris Ancient Debris is a rare material only found in the nether, which is the main source of a different material called netherite. Netherite scraps can be used to upgrade the previously highest tier gear in the game, Diamond Gear. Now, to get the best gear in the game, exploring the nether is essential, and honestly, I am blown away by how good of an incentive it is to finally interact in a more meaningful way with this part of the game. It gives you something more to strive for, and I think that's all the nether really needed to become a worthwhile area to visit. But of course, the new biomes also help in that immensely. Some of them are honestly gorgeous and give an almost ethereal feel to what is otherwise a fiery hellscape. They add nice contrast to the areas around you and greatly help in your orientation since locations actually look really distinct from each other now to where they didn't that much before. The nether feels like an actual fleshed out part of this world now and I'm all for that. Something I'm less positive about, to a point, is the combat. Don't get me wrong, it's serviceable, but it's nothing too special. You can attack with melee weapons by clicking, defend with right click, and that's it really. You can also shoot enemies from afar with a bow, which has some resource management going on with arrows you need to craft and use carefully, though it isn't anything too special either. But you know, that works for this kind of game. Minecraft isn't all too combat oriented. It really is just a means to an end. That is, when it comes to single player. In multiplayer communities, combat is actually a much bigger deal. People do battle against each other constantly, and you need a ridiculous amount of accuracy to get with the best of players. The frequency at which you attack is so high, if your aiming reticle is only off of your opponent for a second, you could already be losing out on potential hits on them, giving them an advantage. In this environment, the combat actually allows for an incredibly high skill ceiling and a lot of skill expression, which is great. In that, it is a reflection of Minecraft in general, really. It's simple on the surface, but it can be as complex as you want it to be. Unfortunately, that all changed when the 1.9 update, or the combat update, released in 2016. I don't really have time to go into all of these specific changes since there are quite many, but I'll highlight what I consider to be the most impactful ones. Shields and a cooldown on attacks. Before getting into anything else, the changes in this update really don't affect the regular survival experience that much. In fact, I think these changes might work better there than the combat system before it did, since it's generally just you fighting AI. The attack cooldown is a tap more strategic in its use, as you need to dance around your enemies at the right times and strike as soon as the cooldown wears off, and shields provide some more protection, making you feel safer. So why is this a problem in multiplayer? Well, generally, multiplayer combat matches are played in very strong armor and with very strong weapons. Overall, the damage taken isn't very high though, so matches can last a bit longer. Since players could hit each other very frequently, they didn't tend to drag on too long either. 
Players also only had a very limited area with which to block incoming attacks, so fights became more about skillfully evading your opponent's strikes when possible and hitting them as many times as you could. When you then introduce shields, which easily negate a lot of damage, matches not only tend to drag on for a long time, the combat also starts to become more about holding up your shield rather than moving unpredictably to evade your opponent's attacks. You can see how this doesn't really incentivize skillful play and instead pushes you towards the easy way out. That is, without even mentioning the attack cooldown. This mechanic not only adds to the dragged out nature that combat has now as there are simply less windows to hit your opponents, it also incentivizes less skillful play. Rather than keeping your reticle on your opponent at all times like before, carefully following their every move, you now only need to be looking at your opponent when your cooldown is up since it doesn't really matter if you're aiming at your opponent otherwise. I think that's disappointing as this combat update isn't that meaningful in survival either. It's slightly more varied, sure, but it doesn't really offer anything wildly different from before and there are no enemies that take advantage of the implemented mechanics in clever ways. This makes it so the multiplayer combat communities are forced to play on older versions of the game that don't feature many of the great additions that came later on. I feel like the developers could have paid more attention to these communities when implementing the changes in that regard. But alright, that's enough about that. Moving on to a somewhat adjacent topic, I think boss fights in Minecraft are both a great asset but also somewhat of a letdown. One of those letdowns being that there are only two of them. The big bad final boss of the game, the Ender Dragon, introduced with the full release of Minecraft with 1.0 in 2011, and the Wither, a secret boss of sorts, which got introduced in 1.4.2, or the pretty scary update back in 2012. What is great about these fights is that they offer an additional incentive to keep playing and get better gear and weapons. These battles are pretty tough and you need to be geared up appropriately beforehand. This incentive is especially great for less creatively inclined players who would rather explore the world and fight enemies than build elaborate structures. These players are sort of neglected in a lot of Minecraft's design, so it's more than appropriate they get something to strive for. That does go into my problem with these fights though. They don't offer too much of a reward for beating them. The Ender Dragon gives you a bunch of experience, I guess, and access to the credits and this vague story sequence. While the latter sort of interesting, I suppose, there isn't much going on with the dragon besides that, which is a shame. It would be great if you could obtain special gear or something. Anything. The Wither is a bit better in this regard. This is a secret boss that can only be fought when it's built by the player. You need certain materials from the nether for this, which was a decent incentive to go in there, but honestly, building and defeating the wither is not worth the hassle. Defeating it only nets you experience once again, but also gives you nether stars. The only thing those are good for is crafting beacons, which can grant buffs to players from a distance and be an orientation point of sorts. That would be great, but by the point in the game where you could reasonably fight the wither, as it's the biggest combat challenge the game has to offer, you're probably already strong enough and have made your own space big enough to not have to rely on either of these benefits. As such, it makes fighting the Wither quite meaningless as well. In the end, all these boss fights boil down to then is just fighting them for the hell of it, which can be a compelling enough incentive for some, but not for others. It certainly wouldn't be for me. I think a lot could be done to improve boss fights in the game by making them more integral to combat progression or something, and generally just adding more of them. That way, there's much more variety and a lot more to them as to just being bigger enemies to fight without much value. Now next up, I wanted to touch on the arts. That might sound kind of stupid and vague, but it is genuinely mind-boggling how simple features and mechanics facilitate so many forms of art. The most natural fit for this game would be architecture and interior design. When you're designing your house by placing blocks, that's, in a way, architecture. But then, you can also use those same blocks to create simple pixel art, or if you're really ambitious, actual full-fledged artwork. Books, which were implemented in Minecraft 1.3.1 in 2012, naturally encourage writing of all sorts. You can craft in-game narratives, just some flavor text, or potentially write entire novels. The choice is yours. Then there's also music. In Minecraft Beta, released in 2010, Note blocks were implemented as part of the loads of important redstone tools that version added. With this, however, people went absolutely wild. People would recreate songs in Minecraft or even make their own music using these note blocks.
In combination with redstone, these blocks turn into insane musical instruments in and of themselves. I have to say, I don't have much profound wisdom to add here. I don't. I just find it so damn impressive that through such minimal features, this game turns into a canvas, a musical instrument, a book. I'm sure tons of people have been creatively stimulated through Minecraft and have been encouraged to start making art outside of it too, because they got comfortable enough to step outside of Minecraft's boundaries. I'd like to believe that people have been able to make a career out of art through their start in Minecraft. And what could be more beautiful than that? That's all I wanted to look at from the perspective of the actual game itself and what the developers have made, but I would be stupid not to mention the modding community very briefly. This community has done so much for the game, driving much of the player base to keep going when they'd otherwise quit. Some modders implemented many of the newer features before the devs themselves even did. Plenty of mods also fundamentally alter the game by including new systems and mechanics, essentially transforming it into a completely different game. I guess Minecraft's even incentivized game development, I think we've come full circle. Including mods, Minecraft will never leave you without things to do. If you do decide to play Minecraft if you haven't already, I highly recommend you check out the wonderful modding work people have done. With all that said, I have and probably will never be a Minecraft fan, but over the course of researching this video as well as playing it for footage for more hours than I'd like to admit, I've really come to appreciate this game and all that it's able to do. Sure, it's not perfect, but it doesn't need to be. I can see why people love it so much now, and from a game design perspective, I can see how clever the devs have been with this game in a lot of areas. That said, there are so many more things to this game than I've talked about in the video. If you want to find out more, simply play the game for yourself, as you can play most versions of the game simply through the Minecraft launcher, but you can also read up on everything to do with the game through the Minecraft wiki. Honestly though, if this video has warmed you up in the slightest to the idea of playing this game, I recommend you do so. If you haven't picked it up in a while, try it out now and see what's new, see where you land. I genuinely had fun with the game, even by myself, and I know I'll pick it up again from time to time as well, and stay in the loop with updates to come. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll hopefully see you all in the next video.